All right, good afternoon. Are we doing pretty well this year? 12.06, 12.07? I'm pretty proud of myself. What? No, no. We've seen worse. Um, all right, uh, Martin Griffiths, the Special Envoy for Yemen, briefed the Security Council on the situation in that country. And he said that Yemen had been kept safe in recent weeks, even as the wider region had been in crisis. Most importantly, he said, this is a time of cr in, in this time of crisis, we have seen no major acts of military provocation in Yemen. And indeed, it has been one of the quietest weeks in Yemen since the war began. Mr. Griffiths said the regional crisis has tested the resilience of various efforts being undertaken by the parties and that these endeavors must make progress if we are real to realize the ambition that 2020 will bring peace to Yemen. <clears throat> uh, Ramesh Rajasinghe from the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs also briefed the Council and he said that Yemen is on the whole less dangerous for civilians than it was before the Stockholm Agreement with civilian fatalities down by almost half but it is still a very dangerous place. He said, adding that although clashes have mostly been contained, we continue to see mass casualty incidents across the country. Mr. Griffiths, uh, we'll speak to you at the stakeout after consultations are done, which is probably not before 1.15 or so. Um, turning to Iraq, Marta Huedas, the humanitarian coordinator for the UN in that country, expressed her strong concern today over the suspension in granting access letters to humanitarian actors are carrying out critical missions in support of Iraq's vulnerable people. Such permissions were previously issued every 30 days by the mandated governmental bodies. However, since November 2019, aid deliveries throughout Iraq have slowed considerably due to the discontinuation of previously agreed upon access authorization procedures and the absence of viable alternative mechanisms. Unless partners are allowed to, to immediately resume full, unimpeded movements of their personnel and supplies, humanitarian actors' operations in Iraq may, become, may come to a complete halt in a matter of weeks. Ms. Ms. Reidas requested the government of Iraq provide clarity on the procedures for granting access authorizations for humanitarian organizations and to allow the UN to resume delivering aid effectively and efficiently for the people of Iraq. Um, and I was asked yesterday about our humanitarian operations have been affected in Syria by the suspension of activity at two crossing points we had been using. I can tell you that the health sector is the one most affected by the suspension of the Al Harubiya border crossing in the Northeast. In 2019, 1.43 million medical treatments were shipped across that crossing point to support people in need. These cross border shipments have now come to an end. WHO estimates that health service availability will be reduced in the medium term and that gaps cannot yet be met through the other mechanisms. Services that are expected to be the most affected include child health, reproductive health, secondary health care, including trauma care, mental health, and nutrition. In addition, to allow the, for the extension of the border crossing points into northwest Syria for another six months, the Security Ca Council, in passing Resolution 2504, tasked the Secretary General on the feasibility of using alternative modalities for Yerubia by the end of February. The Secretary General reiterates the importance of sustained, unimpeded, and safe humanitarian access for all those who need it. The Secretary General, supported by the Secretariat and the UN humanitarian agencies, will do everything possible to respond to the, to the request of the Security Council. And uh, on Libya, I can tell you that Special Representative Ghassan Salame is continuing his engagements with Libyan and international uh, stakeholders ahead of the Berlin summit. The Special Representative met with Prime Minister Siraj in Tripoli uh, yesterday to discuss the latest developments in the ceasefire and the preparations for Berlin. Also yesterday, he, together with the head of the World Health Organization in Libya, Mr. Salame, visited a temporary shelter for internally displaced people in Tripoli and listened to their concerns and needs. And an update from the Philippines, where the UN and our partners are assisting with technical and logistical needs of local and regional authorities. Although the volcanic activity has decreased in the last 24 hours, Authorities continue to evacuate people from living, living within a 14-kilometer of the erupting Tal volcano. 
with over 57,000 people relocated as of today to 257 evacuation centers. Humanitarian organizations are conducting assessments and have identified the need to support evacuees and host communities with water, sanitation and hygiene supplies, sleeping kits and health assistance. The UN stands ready to provide further assistance if needed. And the World Food Program today said that a record 45 million people, mostly women and children, are gravely food insecure following repeated drought, widespread flooding, and economic uh, disarray in southern Africa. WFP warns that crisis deepens. The world must now step up to save lives and enable communities to adapt to climate change. The agency is supporting 8.3 million people in eight countries, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Zambia, Madagascar, Namibia, Iswatini, Lesotho, and Malawi. WFP is urgently calling for an additional $284 million for food needs, stressing the needs for more frequent funding as climate-related natural disasters are becoming more frequent. And from Nigeria, the humanitarian coordinator for the UN in that country, Edward Cologne, said today he's deeply relieved that some civilians, including three aid workers who were abducted by non-state armed groups in late December, have been released. He said that uh, the humanitarian workers were providing life-saving support to Nigeria's most vulnerable people in northeastern Borno State, and that they never should have been targeted. Mr. Cologne also voiced concern over the fate of other civilians abducted in the December incidents, as well as others who were taken in earlier incidents. And just a note from Bolivia, as you may have seen, the Secretary General's personal envoy for that country, Jean Arnaud, issued a statement last night in which he commended the ruling by Bolivia's courts regarding the extension of the mandates of the executive and legislative branches and subnational authorities. He stressed that the electoral process to continue, it is essential that all parties refrain from violent action or threat of violence. In this context, Mr. Arnaud joined the rejection expressed by many national actors to the recent statements made by former uh, leader Evo Morales. The envoy also said that <clears throat> authorities have the obligation to protect and guarantee the full exercise of the political rights of all citizens, free from intimidation, regardless of political affiliation. And you saw yesterday also Secretary General met uh, with Makhdoum Shah Mahmoud uh, Qureshi, the Foreign Minister of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. The Secretary General and the Foreign Minister exchanged views on developments in the region. For his part, the Secretary General reiterated the importance of maintaining peace and stability in South Asia through political dialogue, diplomatic solutions, and respect for human rights. And two things to flag, um, 4 p.m. in the Economic and Social Council Chamber, there will be a screening of Eyes on the Goals, a digital series premiere. This is a series of seven videos, each of, the f each of them focusing on a particular sustainable development goals. The videos will also be released online, and once each video hits, hits 10,000 views, $10,000 will be donated to an organization uh, achieving the SDGs. So please click often. Um, and <clears throat> tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., the Secretary General will preside over a ceremony to mark the 10th anniversary of the Haiti earthquake and to honor the memory of the hundreds of thousands of people who died that day. UN staff, ambassadors, and family members of some of the colleagues we lost that day will gather the memorial wall outside the General Assembly in front of the UN flag that flew over the headquarters of the peacekeeping mission in Haiti. Following the ceremony, participants will be invited to the North Lawn to see the Haiti Memorial, originally set up at the UN mission in Port-au-Prince, but moved to New York recently. Um, and we want to welcome a few more countries to the honor roll. Australia, Iceland, New Zealand, and Poland, which brings us up to... Errol, I wish, for once, I wish what you say is true. Uh, it is 10. No, 10. 10. Let's go. Yeah, 193 while we're at it. Uh, after we're done with this stand-up comedy session, uh, Elliot Harris will be here. As you know, he is the UN Chiefs Economist and Assistant Secretary General for Economic and Development, uh, along with Don Holland, Chief of the Global Economic Monitoring Branch in the Department of Econ uh, Economic and Social Affairs. And they will brief you on the launch of the World Economic Situation and Prospects Report 2020. Before we get there, yes, madame. Thank you, staff. Two questions. Uh, first, have you looked into the detention of my colleagues in Egypt? Mm -hmm. 
uh, which happened yesterday. And also, the German foreign minister announced that General Haftar uh, promised to abide by the ceasefire. Uh, you said that uh, Mr. Salame talked to uh, Mr. Saraj yesterday. Has he uh, been in touch with uh, General Haftar? And do you have any confirmation from him that he would uh, abide by the ceasefire? No, I don't have uh, any confirmation. Obviously, uh, if this report true, we, we obviously welcome uh, welcome this. Uh, it is important that all parties uh, abide by the ceasefire for the sake of the Libyan uh, people. Um, on Egypt, uh, we are aware of the recent of the reports that Egyptian security forces uh, raided Anadolu offices in Cairo and reportedly, uh, as you mentioned, arrested four journalists, including one Turkish national, uh, and they've been detained in an unknown location. We are concerned about these developments as well as about the whereabouts and welfare of those who have been detained. Freedom of expression plays a central role in the effective functioning of a democratic political system. Egypt, as a state party to the international human rights treaties, has a responsibility under Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights to protect media that is free to impart information and news. Just a follow-up, would you call for the release of my colleagues? Well, of course, I mean, we call for the release of uh, anyone who is uh, detained. We would want them to see uh, released, or at least at minimum have information as to their, uh, to their whereabouts. Nabil, uh, Ali, sorry, and then James. Thank you, Stefan. In the same uh, spirit, uh, a crackdown in Lebanon against uh, peaceful protesters, but mainly um, attacking uh, journalists, is happening uh, by uh, since 48 hours. So many uh, journalists were attacked, and um, uh, their equipments were uh, taken or bro broke or whatever. Uh, so, any comment on this Look, situation? What, what we said, what I just said uh, about uh, Egypt, um, obviously applies to every country uh, in the world. That freedom of expression uh, plays a central part in the uh, in the functioning of a democratic system. We are concerned about these reports of violence in uh, in Lebanon uh, and the targeting of journalists. Uh, the right to freedom of expression, to peaceful freedom of assembly is a cornerstone of Lebanese democracy, must be respected, including as part of uh, Lebanon's engagements uh, and obligations under international human rights uh, agreements. Just a, a quick follow-up. Do you think there should be uh, accountability for attacks against journalists? It should be whenever uh, we see the use of force uh, against peaceful protesters and including journalists, these things need to be investigated, and people need to be held to account. Madam. Two questions. Uh, the first one is Nicolas Maduro and his state of a state um, invited international organizations to participate and verify the elections, the parliamentary elections. Um, he ordered one of his um, cabinet members to send a letter to the secretary general. So I want to find out if you have received that letter and what will be the prospect of a possible mission of election verification for Venezuela if that was the case. And the second one, um, Nicolas Maduro also released um, over a dozen of um, political prisoners at the beginning of this week. However, it's been claims by families of military detainees. They have already been in jail for the time that the judges have given them the time to be detained, even though they believe that it is unjust, um, and they're still not released from the, them. Uh, is any concerns that these military members detained have become appeased by the government to try to uh, pressure the opposition? Look, I, let, let, uh, on your first question, uh, we've seen the reports uh, on the, the call for participation to oversee the elections. I'm not aware that any letter has been received. Uh, at any time, a letter, a letter would have to be received and a request would have to be, uh, would have to be studied uh, and see how applicable it is under past practices uh, and laws of the United and, and mandates of the United Nations. Uh, on your second one, let me look into that uh, situation. James and then Errol. I have a couple of follow-ups on Libya, if I can. Yeah. Um, first, um, a number of Security Council members are telling me there are discussions underway if there was a ceasefire that was to properly take hold 
in Libya to set up some sort of monitoring for that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what sort of contingency planning is being done? I'm told that the Hodeida thing is one of the potential mm -hmm. models, but clearly Hodeida is one city. Libya is a vast country. How many monitors would be required for this sort of operation? Uh, the short answer is, of course, uh, contingency plans are being made. You know, we are, our colleagues in the peace operations and political affairs don't live in a vacuum. They see the discussions that are going on and then they understand how things may may evolve. Uh, so there are all sorts of different uh, of different models. We would have to see what the Security Council comes up with uh, and hopefully there will be some discussions before to make sure it is something that is actually uh, feasible. But I, I, I don't want to be dragged into an abstract conversation, but I think your, your question is self-answered. Right. I mean, uh, one can look at Hodeida as a model of, you know, people monitoring ceasefires in civilian clothes in a small area. Libya, as you point out, is rather larger than the municipality of Hodeida. Um, the new Secretary General report to the Security Council on Libya has been delivered to the Security Council. Uh, one of the things that's very notable about it is the situation in the east, particularly Benghazi. It describes Benghazi becoming a hub of illicit economic activities, including the sale of drugs and arms. T talks about uh, assassinations, attacks, uh, and abductions. How concerned is the Secretary General about the situation in the east of Libya? Well, uh, first of all, the Secretary General's report has been given advanced copies. It's not yet out as an official document, so um, I'm not getting details of that, but the, the report is in the Secretary General's words. So it reflects, uh, it reflects his opinion. I think by highlighting that situation, it's a way of expressing his, his concern. Errol, and then we'll go back, and then we'll move, and then Maria, who's been very patient, Thank as always. Thank you. Two quick, I would say, follow-ups. First is definitely follow-up on my Turkish colleague a question on for Turkish journalists. When you say uh, that you are condemning this uh, act of the Egyptian authorities and you express all your concern. Uh, what actually did you do uh, to change the situation on the ground? I mean, in the specific situation, did you call what you intend to do? Because people I mean, are first of all, uh, contacts are, are being had at, uh, at various levels. And I think speaking very publicly about the issue is also one way to act. And a quick uh, follow-up is actually, since I don't like to be seen as complicit in what is the criticism of you, and besides to, to place it that I was uh, full-heartedly for the Secretary General, but he was heavily criticized exactly for giving a broad, through you or himself, broad answers, broad criticism of human rights abusers, but not specific one. It was Kent's rot uh, words, but many would agree with those, including these journalists. So what do you say on that? I think the Secretary General has been uh, very strong and clear in his defense of human rights, in his defense of human rights defenders, and his defense of the rights of journalists to practice their trade unmolested and unhindered. Yes, sir. I think I've answered your question. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Uh, my question is related to the Rohingya refugees of uh, Bangladesh, who are now in Bangladesh. There are reports of uh, measles breakout in the refugee camps in Bangladesh in Cox's Bazar, and uh, 428 cases have been reported. Is there any immediate plan to address this I'll have problem? To I haven't seen that particular report, but I'm sure we have a huge humanitarian operation in Cox's Bazaar, uh, and I have no doubt they're on top of it, but I will get back to you. Maria. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Uh, so uh, almost one week has passed since uh, Iranian mission addressed a letter to Secretary General on uh, the issue of, uh, of denial of uh, U.S. visa to Iranian foreign minister. Uh, Mr. Zarif, um, and as I understand, uh, this will be discussed tomorrow at host country meeting. So, do you have any comment by now on this? Or probably, does SG has uh, any decisions, uh, uh, particularly on the topic of um, uh, legal actions? Well, you know, we, we have, uh, and I think in answer some of the questions you've raised in in, in the fall and, and recently, uh, raised our concern with the host country. 
uh, about the non-issuance of visas to certain delegations. This continues to be a concern to us, uh, and we continue to raise it. And um, uh, and as you said, it has also been taken up by the host country uh, committee. But the act of the visa issuance is not one done by the secretariat. It's done by uh, the host country. Yep. Can you confirm that the UN uh, plans to convene its own conference on Libya for, in Geneva following the Berlin one with the uh, participation of the country? Yeah, I mean, I think that's something Mr. Salome has, uh, has talked about. Yes, Nabil, and then... Um, are there any uh, other alternatives to uh, humanitarian or medical uh, aids to arrive to the northeastern part of Syria? from Damascus, for example, would this be an option? Well, I mean, we're obviously, you know, humanitarian aid has been coming through crossing points, uh, through Turkey and then uh, Iraq. That's no longer, Iraq's no longer an option. Uh, we will continue to find the best ways to deliver it, uh, whether it's through the, the cross-border points uh, from Turkey or through Damascus. It obviously also depends on where... The, the front so-called front lines are right and things shift so we will always be looking for that one in that is the most effective uh, to get uh, the aid the most effective way for the aid to get through would be for the fighting to stop but I mean have you talked to authorities in Damascus yeah, we're, about we're all, I mean uh, our humanitarian colleagues spend quite a time doing that and do you think this is doable? Logistically I, I, and politically. Listen, maybe. what is, uh, you know, you're, you're operating in a very challenging uh, environment. We're looking at different options. And as, as mandated by the, um, uh, by the Security Council, we're now looking uh, to report back to them by the end of February on the different options. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Uh, with regard to the Iran nuclear deal and the three European countries having triggered mm -hmm. this dispute mechanism, um, there's now a joint commission, and assuming that they can't resolve this, eventually it will go to the advisory board, which I understand consists of three members, one um, assigned by Iran, one by the European countries, and a third one that's an independent member. I'm wondering if the SG's office has been approached about considering people a uh, member, an independent member to no, be No, not third. that I'm aware of, but I will check. Zach. Uh, Stefan, on Monday, um, Mustafa Qasim, who's a... Uh, U.S. resident as well as an, an Egyptian national died in um, prison in Cairo. Uh, has the Secretary General uh, heard about this? I think Masood asked about it on Tuesday. And, I mean, um, we, we, we no hope comment. the circumstances surrounding his death are fully investigated. James. Yeah, sorry, back to Libya again, and again back to General Hafter, because it does seem that there is one man who is standing in the way of the international process with regard uh, to Libya. The Secretary-General is someone who has great experience dealing with General Hafter and back in April was negotiating him for a long period of yeah. time just before he started his audacious offensive on Tripoli. So is the Secretary-General worried that what is supposed to be an international gathering of Berlin going forward, now it looks like General Hafter will be there, is going to become yet another negotiation with General Hafter and is he frustrated by this? I think the... the the Secretary General, if he's frustrated by one thing, is the continuing uh, fighting, the continuing suffering of the Libyan uh, people. We will use uh, Berlin uh, as uh, a way forward in uh, the plan laid out by Mr. Salome. I don't want to prejudge the conference, prejudge the discussions and the contacts that will be had, not only around the table, uh, but on the side. I think let's Let's let Berlin happen before we judge Berlin. Errol. Just one more. Uh, did the Secretary General have the chance to see the new report 2020 of Human Rights Watch? And if he did, what are his conclusions or comments? I mean, he's, he's aware of the report, and I think the Secretary General is aware of uh, the body of reporting that the UN's own human rights mechanisms does, special rapporteurs, the, uh, his own people. Uh, so he's, he is very, we always appreciate reading uh, human rights reports by human rights uh, defenders, and this one is no different. I will go get Mr. Harris.